Ah, Metroid, one of the better series that Nintendo has produced, but with so many games and multiple different developers, what is the true story and what isn't? Or at least, what is canon and what is an alternate timeline? It's not a huge amount, but there has been a tiny bit of controversy about whether or not Metroid Prime is canon, and the same goes for Metroid Other M. And with a new Prime having just been announced, I decided to take a look at this controversy to get to the bottom of it. So setting up the timeline based on in-game dates, the first is Metroid and the remake Zero Mission. And then we have Metroid Prime, Hunters, Echoes, Corruption, Federation Force, Return of Samus, Super Metroid, Metroid Other M, and Metroid Fusion. So. Wait, what is canon in this scenario? Hmm, I'm glad you asked. Well, canon in normal terms means what is officially part of the story and what isn't. So that weird fanfic you wrote about Samus going on a crossover adventure with Thomas the Tank Engine? That is not canon. It's a made up story that doesn't affect the actual canon story. Normally, canon is a part of the story that is made by the original creators or people that the creators have entrusted with the story. So, wait. Why are people even arguing about this? They are all official games published by Nintendo, right? They all have the Nintendo seal of approval. Well, this conflict stems from one really big thing called fans. Fans of the Metroid series seem to be mixed on whether Prime is canon or not, that being part of the same universe, and the same goes for Metroid Other M. And there are of course a number of reasons for this, for example, what if the official story contradicts itself? Or what if they sourced a different company to write the story? Would it still be canon? That's what we are discussing today. So what do I mean when I say the Prime series? Well, it's all of the Metroid games with the Prime subtext. So we have Metroid Prime, Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, Metroid Prime Hunters, Metroid Prime 3 Corruption, Metroid Prime Federation Force, and now Metroid Prime 4. Two of the Metroid Prime games, Hunters and Federation Force, are written and developed by different parties than the other three. As such, some people say that Hunters and Federation Force may not be part of the Prime storyline due to how little they interact and fit in, and the fact that they were made by different studios. Though there are some instances where their stories do intertwine and help them tie into the same universe, but it's mainly tiny tidbits and text logs. Metroid Prime Hunters is a self-encompassing game that starts and ends within its own duration, but we can see that the stories do intertwine as seen at the end of Prime 3, which was made by the development team Retro Studios. During this special ending, you can see a mysterious ship that resembles the character Silux. Silux is a character that was first introduced in Metroid Prime Hunters. It was theorized for quite some time by fans that this was his ship, the Delano 7, or some variation of his ship. But that was not confirmed until E3 2015, when Kensuke Tanabe, one of the producers of the Prime series, stated that it was, in fact, Silux the Bounty Hunter. That may integrate Hunters into the continuity, but what about Federation Force? Well, Silux again is theorized to have an appearance at the end of Federation Force during a special ending where you are able to see what many believe to be his shoulder pad while stealing a Metroid while it's hatching. So now we know that the Prime series is at least the same self-contained universe, and the way Samus acts in each is at least similar. So we ask the question, is Metroid Prime canon to the other Metroids? Let's start out with the biggest issue with Prime's canon status. The games weren't created by R&D 1 or directed by Sakamoto, Samus's daddy. So that, to many, is a major ding. A game not written by the original creators? Well, boom, there you go, it's not canon, right? Well, if we go based off of that, then the only games that are true canon would be the ones made by R&D 1. So we have Metroid, Metroid 2, Super Metroid, and Metroid Fusion. That's less than half of the Metroid games. Sakamoto may have been one of the directors of Other M, but the game itself was made by Team Ninja, a completely different team than R&D 1. The next big issue is that Sakamoto has never been firm on whether or not the Prime series is canon, even saying that they are almost an alternative or a guide-in to the Primeless Metroids which means to him they are like a side story or a tale. In 2010, Nintendo published a magazine for Mario's 25th anniversary, and it included an article interviewing Sakamoto, where, when asked about the Prime Trilogy's canon status, he stated, We wanted to explore Metroid's possibilities as a subjective, first-person action game. A member of Nintendo mentioned Retro, a studio that had great experience in this field. I didn't participate a lot in these games. I supervised that they maintained the essence of the franchise, but we gave them a lot of liberty with the plot. In fact, 
I have always seen the story of the Primes as an alternative, and not integrated in the story of the other Metroids. That's the reason they had total liberty when creating it. And they made Samus different. Tougher. In this and other interviews on the subject, he is clearly distancing himself and the mainline Metroid IP away from the Prime games stating that he let the developer, Retro, have almost full reign of the direction and plot of these games to create their own story with Samus. The creator saying that a game was seen as an alternative or non-integrated into the rest of the series is the final nail in the coffin for Prime's canon. Generally speaking, the word of God rule goes where the original story creator has total say over the story's canon, including retconning previous things so that current plot points make sense. So really now, there should be no debate on this, right? Well, not exactly. You see, the Prime series was very well received by the Western audiences, and is seen as almost superior to the other releases. Also, there really isn't anything in the Prime series that would totally contradict Samus's character or her motivations. Even the lore and plot details all fit snugly into Metroid overall. I don't see Prime as being strictly non-canon, but if the creator said that it's more of an alternative story, then perhaps it is canon, at least for now. But not in the last Metroid storyline, thanks to Other M. And this leads right into the next point, that some say that Prime is the true canon, and Metroid Other M is the non-canon one. So, is Metroid Other M canon? In Metroid Other M, we see Sakamoto's disdain. There are almost no mentions of Prime or any of the events in Prime, almost as if the storylines are separate, or because someone didn't like the Prime series, because Prime did better than his own. Other M, at multiple points, even contradicts Prime's storyline, or simply ignores Prime's events. Some fans state that the thing Samus does in Other M is so out of character for her that it simply can't be true canon. We see her go from a solo, silent, alien murdering machine that answers to no one like a tough bounty hunter would, to a warm, overly sympathetic person that follows orders to the point of not using certain weapons unless authorized by someone she doesn't exactly have to listen to anyway. Adam hadn't authorized it. This is obviously a gameplay restriction, unlike every other Metroid where she just loses her abilities at the beginning. Though this has been defended by some who state that she is following protocol and regulations out of respect for her old acting commanding officer. We also see a Samus that has a less powerful emotional wall. She gives in to her PTSD as shown in my other video. Though, this does make her a stronger character. Again, details in that video, I really recommend it. But this game does give us a lot of backstory to Samus through flashbacks, which helps reaffirm its canon by showing flashbacks to previous elements of her story found in previous Metroids. Notably though, none of these flashbacks are in any of the Prime games, despite all of them taking place before. In fact, Other M's story goes as far as to directly contradict Metroid Prime 3's story. After Samus defeats the Grub Mass, she says, It was the first joint mission I'd been a part of since becoming a freelance bounty hunter. And of course, it was the first time since my Federation days that I was following the orders of a commanding officer. Samus, as a freelance bounty hunter, was working for the Federation during the events of Prime 3. They hired her to clear a computer virus from their Aurora units. Then, again in the more recent title, Federation Force, she is hired by the Federation to find the Doom's Eye. And all of this happens before the events of Other M. We have another problem during Metroid Fusion, when it introduces the bioweapons plot point, which causes two problems. One, Samus is shown working for or with the Federation in Fusion, despite her negative experiences with them in Other M. This is not explained, and thus creates a huge plot hole. Counterpoint, although she's shown working for the BSL specifically, which appears to be a privately run company not run by the Federation. Counter counterpoint, then again there are many data points where it states the Weapon X program is Federation property. But this is found out after you embark on your mission with Samus's ultimate decision to blow the station up, which would go with her character of hating the use and development of bioweapons. The second problem is that Samus does not mention or hint at any of the experiences from Other M in Fusion, nor is there anything explaining why she wouldn't. The only connection point that Fusion does have to Other M is the ship's AI, which is renamed by Samus to Adam, a previous commander she had, the same one in Other M. This could have been the Other M developers using this as a chance to try to link the story into the other game. Unfortunately, this was most likely caused just by the fact that Fusion was made in 2002, and Other M was made in 2010. So the developers were forced to use what was available to them from Fusion. 
making Adam was the only real point that they could expand upon, using the ship's AI as a basis for his personality. Notably, this showcases one of many plot holes that exist because they made the games out of sync. Super Metroid, a game which came out in 1994, is the third to last entry in the timeline, with the only events taking place after are the ones that are seen in Fusion, produced in 2002, and Other M, which was made in 2010. The latest game that has been made is Metroid Federation Force, published in 2016, with its location being pretty much in the middle, and this leapfrogging all over the place is likely the main cause of issues regarding continuity. But then again, you could always try harder in writing your story to make sure it doesn't directly contradict itself multiple times all because of one game. One other conflicting thing in Other M was the statement that the Federation had to use genetic manipulation to take out the vulnerability to cold in Metroids. But this trait is actually explained in Metroid 2 as they already lose this naturally through metamorphosis. Some fans also point out how strange it is that the space pirates from Other M are able to recreate Mother Brain, despite it being insanely advanced yet lost Chozo organic computer technology. Another plot hole fans frequently use to make the game non-canon is why does Samus freak out at Ridley even though she's killed him like a bazillion times? Well, we've gone over this in that video that I mentioned earlier. It does make a bit of overall narrative sense, but still. There are plenty of other problems that Other M causes that messes with canon and continuity, but listing them all would take too long, and I'm sure by now you get the idea. There are quite a few big holes and tiny details that Other M gets wrong. But if you were to remove Other M from the canon of the entire timeline, suddenly all of those big holes and tiny details that are wrong disappear. The real big question is, where are the events that transpired within Samus's character? With Other M, what even is Samus's character anymore? Well, we should start by getting a baseline of classic non-prime games, so that includes Metroid, Metroid 2, and Super Metroid. But these are quite old, and really the surface plot of these games was, shoot Metroids, you're a bounty hunter! Unless you digged into the lore through text logs in the manual, they lacked a lot of story elements. And considering that a lot of people don't dig, it's easy to say that Other M Samus isn't the same Samus, and the same can go for the Prime Samus. Plus, in games where you play a silent protagonist, it's hard to keep the continuity smooth when you start to add in backstory and self-motive, like they started in Fusion, with Samus actually stating opinions and such. And they built upon this character they created in Other M. They gave a voice to an otherwise silent character. That's like if Link started to boast his opinion on pots or started to talk about how much he hated the Dongos. It just wouldn't be the same. People would like the character less. It'd be miserable even. The baby. The baby. And the baby. For the baby. Of the baby. For the baby. Babies cry. The baby. Babies cry. Adam, 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 Let's look at the games in order of release date and look at the character of Samus through that context. First, we have Metroid in 1986. In this rendition, we get a Samus that takes no prisoners and wipes out the Metroid threat after being hired by the Federation. There really isn't much in terms of personality development as the character was still new and games were very different back then. It wasn't even until finishing the game that you even realized Samus was a woman even. In Metroid 2 Return of Samus, which was released in 1992, we get a Samus that has bested the pirates once, and now is on a mission to finish off the last of the Metroids on a new planet after many Federation teams were lost. She finds a lone baby Metroid that she is unable to bring to an end showing that she has compassion or a maternal instinct to some extent. The baby. In Super Metroid from 1994, we get an intro narrative that explains that she left the baby Metroid with science officers only to later find out that Ridley kidnapped the Metroid and destroyed the science station. She confronts the pirate boss once again. During her adventure, she finds the baby Metroid, but now it has grown. The Metroid attacks, but stops just short of killing her. This shows that she isn't all-powerful and has limits. She then faces Mother Brain and almost loses until the baby, who's adult now, returns and drains power from Mother Brain and grants Samus the power. In doing this, the baby is destroyed by Mother Brain, but then Samus uses all the power that she gained to destroy Mother Brain and even the entire planet. This shows that Samus feels for the loss of the Metroid that had imprinted on her, and shows that she is prone to fury and rage. 
After some time, Fusion comes out in 2002 where she is sent to a research facility by the Federation to explore a distress signal. She then gets attacked by the X parasites and winds up being fused with what little Metroid DNA the Federation had at the time during which she talks, or rather writes log entries, about her new ship AI, which she later names Adam, as the computer reminds her of one of her previous commanding officers from when she worked as a Federation soldier. This gives us a glimpse at her backstory, explaining that she was once part of the Federation, and what kind of character this Adam was. The beginning of the Metroid manga was released the same year, and this also goes deep into Samus' origin story, including more info and backstory about Adam. At the very end of Fusion, Samus finds out that the Federation is going to use the last of the Metroid DNA of her baby Metroid she had lost in the previous game as a bioweapon. So she, along with her ship's AI, decide to go directly against Federation orders and detonates the space station, eliminating all life on it and the planet it collides with, thus ending the X-Parasite and Metroid species, except for herself as she now contains human, Chozo X, and Metroid DNA. From just these base games that most of all fans agree are canon, we have an efficient killing machine that has wiped out ecosystems and uses all the tools as they are gifted to her by Chozo mentors. Yet, at the same time, we see that she is human and can love or has a maternal instinct and emotions. She just doesn't show them most of the time. We also see that she can channel her anger and rage to do monstrous things like destroy planets. And as a side note, these games all follow one story. The story about the Metroids wiping them out completely, save one, and then that one dies too. We could dub this the last Metroid story arc. And now that we have a baseline for her, we can compare her to the other games. So how do the supposedly non-canon games change her character, and are they plausible enough? In Prime, the storyline is rather contained in each game, with a small overarching story. We are Samus, a strong silent type that destroys Meta Ridley with little hesitation just like in the previous games. During the events of Prime, she is out for her own vengeance and personal mission. In Prime Echoes, she is a caring person that attempts to help a race in need of urgent help against a dark adversary. There is not much in terms of character deviation than what we've established. This game is self-closing except for a few details, such as Dark Samus still surviving. After Echoes is Corruption, where we see Samus fall victim to Phazon Corruption. We see in this story that she can feel emotion, which is shown when she heads to Elysia, where she mourns the loss of the Hunters. We see a weaker Samus, but one that eventually overcomes her weaknesses. When Retro Studios made the Prime series, they made sure to never step on any toes. They made safe games. It doesn't make Samus anything more or less than what she already was established as being. She stayed a powerful bounty hunter that always gets the job done. In fact, it's so safe, really, that even if Prime wasn't canon, the only thing that makes it non-canon is Other M, and the possible feelings of one of Metroid's directors. So if Other M is the only big reason Prime can't be canon, then how about Other M? Here we are shown a Samus that is not an emotionless killing machine. We see her softer side, almost to a fault, during every event of the game and flashbacks. We find a Samus that follows orders from someone who no longer has authority over her, not utilizing key weapons and abilities to ensure the safety of her team, that she only occasionally interacts with in the first place. Also, as a gameplay mechanic, but still. It also shows Samus working with others and not solo. The father figure she looks up to, Adam, is further built upon in this game. This game was very big in terms of character change. It also added a lot of backstory, but interestingly, while this backstory has multiple inconsistencies with Prime primarily, it also doesn't work out too well with other Metroid titles continuity either. But remember that manga I mentioned that came out at the same time as Fusion? That manga goes even further into Samus' backstory and explores Adam and the Federation even more too. But the manga also adapted and changed multiple things about her previous adventures in Metroid and Metroid 2. Interestingly, these adaptations wind End up working with other M. So what is the true canon? Well, the fact is that both are canon, you nerds. Calm down. Just because the creator said or because the game is not as good doesn't make them any less canon. I mean, this happens all the time. Take Sir Conan Arthur Doyle's character Sherlock Holmes. Doyle was so tired of this character after so many books that he planned for Sherlock to come to an end during his final battle with Moriarty. And he does. He falls off a cliff and dies thus ending Sherlock Holmes' story. But 
The fans hated this so much, to the point that Doyle was receiving multiple death threats. You think death threats on the internet are shallow, now imagine death threats with written letters being sent to you, and people in person. And after so much fan backlash and disdain, he, albeit reluctantly, brought his character back in a book that just continues the story, and never mentions Sherlock's death or the final battle at all. So, what's canon? Did he die, or is he still alive? Well, that's up to you, the reader, to decide if it's within your suspension of disbelief. Similarly, it's up to you, the Metroid fan, to decide what is canon and what isn't for you. The argument normally stems from one fan saying that the game they like is better, so the others should be disregarded. But can't we all just like the story, ignoring plot holes and incongruencies? Mistakes like that just happen all the time. I believe that they are both canon, but are separate stories. The Prime series is just that. The Prime series. Or, as another way you could put it is, the Prime arc. It is its own enclosed story or stories, mostly made by the same developers with an end goal. It's not to say that they aren't canon to the non-Prime games, they are just their own story, separate from the last Metroid story that the other games follow. They both have different adventures, different stories to tell. It's just like how we have chapters in our lives, and some chapters, like middle school, happen to be completely encompassed by other chapters, like our childhood. So what do you think? Let me know down below, and check out these other awesome Metroid videos here too. This one explains how Samus having PTSD actually makes her a much stronger character, and this one explains the science of the X-Parasite. So until next time, please remember to never stop using your noggin.